I'm having problems with this behind me. Is it? It's really loud in my ear. Are you guys good? If I move it, maybe, all right. All right. That'll make you feel better. Yes. Makes me feel better too. I can hear better. Okay. A uh, couple things, Jerry. Good to have you home. Bailey is did finally get a flight, and well, he'll get he got one for Tuesday, so he has to stay there in Virginia until Tuesday. But he'll make it back, and the military is going to give him some grace, and so that's good. Um, there are a couple of other things you need to be aware of. Addie, we're glad that Addie's out of the hospital, and and continue to pray for her. She has uh, several several weeks of healing to be done. Um, Tomorrow morning at 6.30, Charles Stewart will have gallbladder Stewart, uh, surgery. Uh, I don't know whether you know who that is. That's his wife has been coming here for several months. Uh, Bobby Stewart sits kind of towards the back in the middle section and uh, have visited with Charles several times. And so that is Melvin Stewart's brother. And so um, can pray for him. I'll be at there at Lincoln County Hospital in the morning and just pray that He's always received me well. Pray that I can be an instrument of God's grace and tomorrow. And then at 8 o'clock, I will run to get to Winchester Hospital for Stan Stewart is having a hernia surgery tomorrow. So remember Charles Stewart and Stan Stewart tomorrow in, um, in their time of healing as well. There... Um, and then one other thing I was going to mention is tomorrow night is the Association Men's Fellowship and Meal Chili and Soup at Prospect Baptist Church at 6.30 tomorrow night. And so, anyway. Let's read the word, John chapter 6. I'm going to have you do something. It's an East Tennessee thing. I don't usually do it, but I feel like to do it. Will you stand for honor of the word as I read? After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted his, up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he, saith, he said unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, remember, this is in all four Gospels. And if you put the four Gospels together, John makes it clear that his, his words to Philip takes place as the company is coming to him. But the test, according to the other three Gospels, lasts all day. So the next thing that you find in relationship to Andrew is actually in the other three Gospels at the end of the day, but there's a testing of the disciples all day long in this. And this Jesus said to him to prove him or to test him. And he himself knew what he would do, meaning Jesus knew what Philip would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread, 200 days wages would not be enough would not be sufficient for them that every one of them may take just a little. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves. As I shared with you, those are basically five small cupcakes that a mother would give to her son for a lunch and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Mark also lets us know that there were women and children, so most of the estimates are 20,000 plus people. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that, that, remain, that, that remain, that nothing be lost. 
Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remain over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet, the prophet, that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed, notice it says a king and not the king, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Father, I pray, I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, for the way that you, in your incredible uh, sovereignty, sew every one of them together. You say exactly what you wanted to say and nothing more, nothing less. May I do the same by your Holy Spirit. May I say nothing more, nothing less than what you desire for this evening. We pray, Father, that you allow that miracle to take place, that creating miracle that takes place in our hearts as the word is broken for us, let it become life in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We started this section of Scripture last Sunday, so let me just give you a review because some of you weren't here last Sunday for that part. And so um, we talked about how this is the only miracle that Jesus did that's in all four Gospels. And I shared with you that to me that's, that, that means that God wants me to get it. When God says something once, I should hear it. When He says it twice, He's saying you really need to hear it. When He says three times, I'm hoping you paying attention when he says it four times he's saying you're really slow this is something you should not get and we talked about of all the miracles that jesus did like raising the lazarus which is only in one gospel you and i probably would not have picked the feeding of five thousand as the one miracle to put in all five but god in his sovereignty chose this miracle as i have been studying through the gospel of john especially chapter six I realize that God is stringing a beautiful pearl throughout, chapter, throughout John. But in chapter 6, this miracle, this, this particular scripture gives understanding to the next one and to the next. Because the, in the rest of John, there's two things, other things. The next one is walking on the water or the stealing of the storm where Jesus walk, walks on the water. It is in Mark that I shared last time. It is Mark, and only Mark, where Mark takes this miracle and he ties it into Jesus um, still in the storm, where in Mark it says that, that Jesus is amazed at their unbelief because they haven't looked down at the basket. Each of them had, were, had 12 baskets, and they were full. In other words, they have already, so shortly before the night is over, less than, less than 12 hours, they have already forgotten what God has done for them. And it was right there at their feet. Mark connects that miracle to walking on the water. And then the rest of John is about, it is the first of, of the seven I am passages where Jesus says, I am. Which the mayor's statement was go, takes you all the way back to the burning bush where Moses says, who are you? And he says, I am. I am God. And, and then John, got, got, John is going to give us seven I am's. And the first one he says, I am the bread that came down from heaven that has been broken for you. And so this miracle gives understanding to everything else we're going to read in the gospel, in, in, this, in this chapter and beyond. It connects it all. We talked about all the things about the fact that, that um, Jesus um, is testing the disciples. He even, in one of the Gospels, I think it's also in Mark, he sends them out to do an inventory before he does the miracle. And the fact that there are so many thousand people that he has to go around and ask each family if they have anything just reinforces the fact that what he's about to do, they better not forget. Because they themselves have done the inventory and know that there is no way that there's sufficient food in the crowd to do this. Nobody's going to have time to go get anything, and the disciples know when he does it. So in other words, the feeding of the 5,000 is much more for the disciples than it is for everybody else. And Jesus is constantly trying to get them to understand that. 
Yes, he feeds them because he is compassionate and moved with compassion. His guts are said to move. That's the Greek word for compassion used in these passages. And yes, Luke says that he welcomes them. He literally embraces this crowd. He has just experienced the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. He is, he is tired. He is weary. It says in, in um, I think it's Luke. Don't, let me, don't hold me that to that one. But in one of the Gospels, it says that he takes them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee because they haven't had time to even eat. There are so many people, and they are weary. And the word they means Jesus and the disciples. So he comes across, he's looking for a solitary place, but we find in Mark that the people run. They don't get in a boat and come across. They run around the lake to the other side, several, several, several miles, and they beat Jesus to the other side. There are so much in this passage. There are, and so, uh, though I've gone through most of it, I want to revisit one and then go take take you through, I think there's 16 or 17 truths. And so I'm just going to basically present them to you and try my best not to preach on every one of them. But I do want to hit one. It was interesting, though, last Sunday I talked about a lot of stuff and really went over very briefly about the baskets at the feet. But all week long, I've had one conversation after another of people telling me, I've been looking at my basket. I've been looking at my basket. I shared with the men about going to the Bailey Manor to do the Bible study on Wednesday, and as I come in, come in the door... The social worker takes me to the office and says, I need to let you know that, and she told me the name of the couple. There's a couple that comes. He has Alzheimer's. She doesn't. She just needs assisted living. And she takes me to the room. She says, you need to know that he died. He died since you've come. And she, I don't know whether she'll be in there. They were gospel singers in our Baptist churches. I knew them when I was a director of mission. I've seen them around. And, and so, but I get in there for the Bible study, and there she is. I go all the way through sharing about what I preached Sunday night. I preached there, and, and I went very briefly over the baskets. At the end, I'm going around just loving on the people before I leave, and she says to me, she said, I learned something tonight, something I had never heard before. She said, last few days, I forgot about my basket. I forgot about my basket. I asked Trish Sunday night, I think it was after on our way home, I said, what part of the sermon caught your attention? And she said, the baskets. You see, the baskets is what caught my attention when I was studying it. I mean, I preached about it all, but it was the basket. And it's interesting, I never had to tell you that. In fact, I cried because I was holding it for this night. And for actually for later, when we do next, the next time when we preach on the, because the basket is more important to the, storm than it is to the feeding you understand that but when i was studying it it was the basket i made the comment to several men in the men's thing when they were sharing that you're a bat you're you're a broken piece in somebody's basket don't forget that that is true we are The miracles that God has done for us are not just in our baskets. The miracles that God has done in our lives are also pieces in other people's baskets. What's interesting about the Scripture is they do the inventory and there's not even enough to fill up even one basket. But after it's done, all 12 baskets are full. Now, understand this. There's not a 13th basket. They all have the same basket and they all have the same fullness. None of them are half full or three quarters full. They're all full. All 12, including Judas, has this basket full. It will be a couple weeks just because of what's got to take place before I can get there to preach on the walking on the water. But in the midst of now and the time we get to that scripture, don't forget, God has filled your basket. 
and he keeps it full. You'll do a lot better in the storms if you look down at your feet. And then you'll be able to look up beyond the storm because you'll have something to remember, remind you of where you're supposed to look. Well, there are a whole lot of other truths in here. 17, according to my little notebook. 17 truths. Now, these are just mine. These don't have to be yours. These are the 17 truths that I found, and most of them really don't need a whole lot of comment. The first one is the needs of others are more important to Jesus than his own desire for food. That's chapter 4. That's what we learned, right? Chapter 4, at the, at the woman at the well, they, they, all the disciples are out buying food. They're all filling up their baskets. Here's the thing. If you're filling up your basket, you will always be filling up your basket. But if you'll let Jesus fill up your basket, it'll always be full. The needs of others are more important to Jesus than his own desire for food or solitude or rest and even the life, his life itself, which comes up later in John chapter 6. Are they to me? Are the needs of others more important to me than my own needs? What about you? You see, the reason Jesus is on this other side is because he was trying to get away from the crowd because the disciples and him haven't had anything to eat. They haven't had any rest. It is a time of grief. John the Baptist just been beheaded and Jesus is about is in a state of grief and he's just looking for some time alone. But he doesn't find that. But Jesus doesn't act like us. That's why the Luke passage where it says and he welcomed them is so amazing. This is the same crowd that he just left on the other side. They have ran around and beat him. He doesn't get back in the boat and go across again. Are the needs of others more important to you than your own needs? Second, a time of loss and weariness never stopped Jesus from being compassionate and doing what was needed. Is this true of me? My experience has been that it is not true of me. Now, I recognize that he is God, but he is also fully man. And I recognize that he has things that I don't have. But if I'm going to be like Christ, well, what does that mean to be Christ-like then? If it doesn't mean to look more and more like him. Third. Jesus tested his disciples... And he still does. Oh, oh, I must have got one out of order here. What was number two? Are they the same? Go, go do three. Okay, that's probably the same. Go to number four. Well, yeah. Let's, um, this is number four. Jesus didn't act differently when there was a crowd than he did with one. I used to say that all the time. Uh, as I was go from churches, sometimes it would be thousands. And sometimes there would be a few dozen. And I constantly asked myself, will I preach differently to this group than I will to that other group? Most of us do. Most preachers I know do. It's hard not to. You see, most of us would probably cancel something if there was just a few. Jesus never acted differently whether it was one or a multitude. Jesus isn't like me. Do I 
Let me go back to the one I think that it got left out. Let me, so let me put, give it. Jesus tested his disciples and he still does. How am I doing with his tests? How are you? You understand that, that if you put these pieces together, this test began when they first come and ends at the evening. Jesus had no problem proving his disciples. They didn't do well. You understand that. They didn't do well before they got in the boat, and they didn't do well when they got in the boat. There is no storm on the bank. They're with Jesus next to him. They still fail the test. When they get in the boat, I guess you figure if they're going to fail the test when they're with him on the land, they're going to definitely fail the test when they're in the sea and he's nowhere around. The question is, though, how am I doing with this test? One thing that I kept hearing as I looked at this part was that Jesus is constantly proving me. Every encounter, every phone call, everything I deal with is really about, am I going to look like him? The same thing is true for you. Every decision you face, when you go back to school and you're teaching or doing whatever you're doing at work, everything, you belong to Him. You're His people. So everything that comes your way, even a boy with a few barley loaves and a few fish, or a whole crowd, everything we deal with is about whether we're going to look like Him or not. How are you doing? How did you do today? Today would have been a pretty easy day to do it. If you were like me, you were pretty much locked up. And good thing is, Trish and I actually got along. Dog didn't behave himself, but I still acted right. Number five, I think. Yes, Jesus didn't run after someone who walked away. I encountered that in all four Gospels. In all four Gospels. But it's not just here. The rich young ruler, over and over again, when Jesus did and showed himself before someone, if they decided to just walk away, he did not chase them down. Now here's my dilemma. What do you do with the one lost sheep? Well, the one lost sheep is his. But those who aren't his, who walk away, he never chased them. Do I? Yes, I do. That's the fixer in me. It's not Jesus in me, though. You hear me? That is not Jesus in me. Chew on that one. I've had a few weeks to do so. That's a hard one. We just can't imagine Jesus. You understand this is a whole multitude that want to make him king and he sends the disciples away and he goes off by himself. One of the gospels says he doesn't give himself to them. And later in the chapter 6, we're going to find out that he is not about to give himself to them. This is a hard one. Number 6. Be careful about shaking off personal responsibility because you don't have or because you don't think they deserve it. Do you remember the description of the crowd? Can I read it to you? I went over it last week. If you look at the description of this multitude, they, Mark says they have no shepherd. They are hungry physically and appear to be spiritually hungry. But they are shallow, self-centered. They are thrill seekers. They're politically minded and motivated. 
They are deceived about what the Messiah looks like and about this prophet that's supposed to come. They are haters of Rome. They are hypocrites. They are doubters. They are forsakers. And yet Jesus still welcomed them, still taught them about the kingdom of God, still healed, and was still moved with compassion towards them. Is this me? More times than I rather it should be. Number seven. We don't always do what Jesus does when we are with him. But we are more, much more likely to experience his correction and help if we stay close. Would you agree? You see, the disciples did not do what they were supposed to do. And they're right there with him. They have been with him two years. This crowd has only been with him a few days. But this, the disciples have been with him for two years. What is your excuse? Some of you have been with him much longer than two years. If you stay closer, he can correct you easier. Number eight, never miss the magnitude of Jesus' power because you are focused on the magnitude of the problem. It was a pretty big problem with no resources. But one of the things, and Will brought this out in our men's thing, and it's not just with this. You see, what's the first miracle in the Gospel of John? The water to wine. Now, that requires what? A creative act. Do you understand that every miracle that is done by Jesus requires a creative act? Whether it's healing or whatever, a creation, a creative act takes place. Whether it's from a lost person to a saved person, he takes them and makes a new creature. Now, the reason for that it is true like that, because he is the creator. Which is the first message of John chapter 1. He is what? To know Jesus, to know him as God. Don't forget that Jesus is God. Or all you will see will be the problem. Churches are good for this. Pastors are too. Deacons are good for this. Well, shucks. We're all good for this. And we have a tendency to make problems bigger than they really are sometimes. Now, sometimes they are really big. But sometimes we have a tendency to make them bigger. Never let your problem be bigger than God. God is always bigger. If you are going to make an attempt to start with faith, then finish with it. You see, that's what Andrew does. L listen to his statement. Andrew comes in and he, listen to what he says. There is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they so, among so many? He was doing really good. It's... You see, before Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and sinks, Andrew does. And Peter gets wet. It's pretty obvious when Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and sinks. But do you not realize that Andrew just did the same thing? 
We miss this. We'll talk about Andrew's faith. Andrew's faith, he started with it, but he doesn't finish with it. Now, that is me. Have you ever, and, and I hope I don't do this, but if I ever do, somebody tells me, Don, that is a vision from God. God is in that, I think, and then all of a sudden, you see me start backtracking, you tell me, Don, you're being an Andrew. You ever seen a church do that? You ever seen this church, this church do that? Churches do it all the time. God's Spirit will be strong and they'll believe it. They'll even vote unanimously to do it. And then within days, oh my goodness, what have we done? If you're going to make an attempt to start with faith, then finish with it. Some of you may have this consistent pattern all the time. You may... Always be talking with faith, but at the same time, you're talking without faith. If that's you, you probably need to come to the altar tonight and say, God, I don't want to be like Andrew. I want to finish like he started. Ten, a little bit faster. Be sure Jesus is what you want and not what he has. That'll come out clearer as we go through the rest of John chapter 6. You see, they just wanted Jesus around so they would always have plenty to eat. By the way, I encounter those regularly. They worship all the time with us. It might be some of you. You really don't want Jesus. You want what he has. Is that you? I don't think it's me, but there are times when it sure looks like me. <laughs> Next. Making Jesus your king doesn't mean he is your Lord and Savior. That one jumped out at me. I thought, well, what's wrong with making him a king? Isn't that what we, make him your king, the king of kings and Lord of, no, that's not it. He's just a king, a one among many. They're looking for someone to liberate them. There are a lot of people by their lives. They don't have any problem in saying, yay, King Jesus, but their lives aren't about to allow him to be king of their lives. And by the way, this crowd was lost. Do you know that? That'll come out in chapter 6. Just because you want to make Jesus your king doesn't mean he will be your Lord and Savior. In fact, you will find him walking away from you. Does that, do you understand that? Next one. One can be filled by what Jesus provides and not have a part in his kingdom. You see, the whole crowd is filled. The word, the word, the Greek word there for filled is used for an animal who goes to the trough and eats until they can't hold any more and then they back away. You can be filled by all that Jesus wants to throw your way. And let me tell you something. To whom much is given, much more is account accountability goes up. And there are a lot of people that God has poured out blessings on their life. He has given them the gospel over and over again. Has given them godly Christian parents and Christian people in their family. Some of them godly Christian husbands or wives. But, and they reap all the benefits of it. But they're still not part of his kingdom. That's sad. Be careful of what you want. You might get exactly what you want. And that won't last. Next point. 
Not all who ooh and awe ah are true followers. The, the, hey, that's what this, it, it, it's not in this gospel, but if you read the message of it, that's pretty much what happened. Woo, look at it. Oh, my goodness. Uh, they're just all excited. They're ready to raise their hand, jump, do whatever they want. They want to bow. They're, they're tons of emotion. But when he starts talking about some hard stuff, they're going to leave. Not everybody who ooh and awes are true followers. Is this me? Is this you? 14. Getting closer to the end. None that he provides should be wasted. Did you hear Jesus said? That's John. That's important. See, that, that part, that pearl, is very strong through the rest of the Gospel of John, but especially in chapter 6. He wants to make sure that you know that that which is his is not going to be wasted. He doesn't, nothing is wasted that he does. None that he wastes, that he provides, should be wasted. Now, Where is it wasted? Two places in this scripture. It's wasted by the crowd. And the disciples waste it when they get in the boat. I mean, it's still there. But what he did was wasted. It had no benefit in them. It didn't do, produce what it was supposed to do. They forgot to look at their basket. And so what God had done is basically of no good to their life. They wasted it. It wasted it. I mean, it's not like they threw it away or dumped it away. It was still there. They still had, could tell you that story. They could still tell that testimony of it. Am I wasting any of his? I don't know yet. That one I'm chewing on. What about you? It's easier to know you're wasting it when he gets in the boat and says, Fifteen. Jesus' miraculous feedings should prepare us for the storms. Isn't it interesting that this miracle that is found in all four Gospels comes before the storm in three of the Gospels? His miracle and all of his miracles should prepare us for the storms. Has it done that for you? Sixteen. And then one more. Each miracle, and this is very similar to the last one, each miracle should prepare me to trust God to supply in times that are beyond me. In other words... I should learn something from his miracles in my life. Is this the truth for me? Is it the truth for you? I'm not a prophet. Though I have been called one many times, I am not a prophet. Why would God allow us to do this scripture two weeks two Sundays in a row what's going to happen tomorrow in your life why would he want to reinforce this in your life two Sundays I have found this to be true and it don't have to be a prophet to know this that when God begins to say something over and over again He's just getting us ready. Last point. And this is the last point for Don Pearson. That does not mean, because I guarantee it, you can find a whole bunch more in this scripture. Never miss the heavenly bread of life. Because you or I have a full basket of earthly bread of life at, at my feet. 
I should never miss the heavenly bread of life because I have a full basket of earthly bread of life at my feet. Have I? Yeah. Will I? Probably again so. What about you? What's going on in your life or in your realm right now? Maybe it's not about tomorrow. Maybe it's right now. Which of these, if you get in the car and your husband or your wife looks at you and says, what did God say to you tonight? Which one is going to come to the top? Father, Father, help me to be like you. Good days and bad days. Not just when I want to, but when I should as well. Help me not to just be looking for you in the storm, but help me to be looking for you on the land. My basket is big. Just like everyone else's in here, it's big. And you have filled it with fragments of your miracles. Help me not to become so focused on the fragments of the miracles that I miss the wholeness of you. For you are bigger than all of your miracles together. For to know you is to know more than your miracles. Help me, Lord, to look more like you in the days ahead. And Father, help me to remember your word in the time that I need it the most. Help me to not only start with faith, but to finish with faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title that I put to this was to know Jesus to know is to know more than his miracles. You see, it really is to know Jesus is more than to know your basket. Because Jesus is bigger than the basket. He's bigger than all the fragments in it. He's bigger than all of his acts. He's Jesus. Let's stand. Perhaps you need to, some of you have already been to the altar. Perhaps there's some business you need to do. Perhaps it's a time of more recommitment or maybe just a prayer. Lord God, I, I need you to help me to remember number 17, number four. I need to help you. I, I need your help with all of them. I want to look more like you. Maybe that's all that you need to pray. Maybe there's something else in your life. You do what you need to do, and you do it quickly.
runs my soul.